start. So, uh, uh, good evening for uh, for you, Your Excellency in Doha, and everyone that's calling from the Middle East and Qatar. Uh, good afternoon from uh, uh, the East Coast of uh, uh, of the United States in Washington D.C. And good morning from people calling from the West Coast. Uh, we have different regions calling in uh, today. Um, we're happy here at USQBC to host Your Excellency, uh, Minister of uh, Energy Affairs of the State of Qatar, uh, President and CEO of Qatar Petroleum. Uh, and uh, we have as well uh, uh, Ambassador pa uh, Ann Patterson from the US Qatar Business Council. Uh, just a quick uh, housekeeping uh, for our attendees. We will uh, start the panel with, uh, with speeches and then we'll move for questions uh, and, and answers. Uh, please submit your questions through the Q&A uh, bottom in the WebEx webinar system. Uh, address the questions to all panelists or to my name. I will be scanning and reviewing the questions and reading questions as, uh, as we get them. Uh, to also note, we do have uh, some uh, media uh, uh, attending this uh, event uh, from different uh, uh, U.S. media entities and Qatari media entities and they will also maybe ask questions through the system. Uh, welcome again, and uh, I will start with uh, introducing Ambassador Ann Patterson, the president of the U.S. Qatar Business Council, to give, uh, provide her keynote. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the U.S. Qatar Business Council is very pleased to welcome His Excellency Saad al Kabi, the Minister of State for Energy Affairs, and the President and CEO of Qatar Petroleum. QP is a founding member of the council and QP and Conoco Phillips are the current co-chairs. Most everyone here is familiar with the minister's background. His graduation from Penn State, where even then he was affiliated with QP, his long history with the various components of the current QP, and his reform program, which made the entire operation more efficient and aggressive, and its handling of the 2017 embargo which reinforced Qatar's reputation as a reliable supplier and a politically astute one as well. In short, Minister al Kabi has guided Qatar Petroleum as it became one of the world's most admired companies in less than a generation. I'm also very pleased to welcome so many senior executives from major U.S. companies, many of whom have longstanding relationships with Qatar. But we also have companies with us today who would be relatively new to the market, but see its considerable potential. The focus on natural gas has made Qatar into the world's largest supplier and the wealthiest country in the world on a per capita basis. It has also generated very handsome returns for the stockholders of U.S. oil and gas and service companies. LNG was a world's fuel of choice in economies like India that moved away, that are moving away from coal. But Your Excellency, so much has changed in the last few months. The COVID-19 drop in demand has caused huge disruptions in the industry and indeed in the world economy. We all hope that the disputes between the U.S. and China don't go beyond shouting at each other, but there are real potential hotspots like Taiwan, U.S.-China trade, and now Hong Kong, quite apart from the ongoing economic damage to the world's two largest economies. Some of your neighbors are going to suffer, especially from lower oil prices, which could increase unpredictability in the region. So the international picture is a lot darker than it was a few months ago. So Excellency, I think our participants are eager to hear how you see the international environment for LNG right now. There was an huge excitement about the Northfield expansion, which will secure Cutter's dominant position in LNG for years to come and frankly, get the jump on the competition. This expansion represented a big opportunity for U.S. companies to partner with you, and the revenue generated would have given Qatar the desirable problem of investing all that additional income. Qatar Petroleum was also a leader in localization so that the LNG expansion would transfer technology to Qatar. I also think it is fair to say that Qatar has been in the forefront on environmental issues and these environmental initiatives provide commercial opportunities as well. So there's a lot to talk about today, and we are so grateful for your time, particularly during the final days of Ramadan and the beginning of Eid. Uh, thank you so much. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, uh, Ambassador Ann, and, and uh, 
Mohammed, and I'd like to thank really the council and uh, you know for inviting me uh, over to have this uh, nice chat with you. I would have preferred to have it uh, face to face, but we're in a new world that uh, I think has uh, all of us in the same boat and, and everybody quarantining themselves and trying to isolate themselves for uh, the betterment of everybody and, and to keep everybody safe. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody that's joining us uh, from around the, the world uh, and thank them for uh, joining us. I've been asked to give a brief about what uh, my view is on the oil and gas uh, industry in general, LNG in specific, especially uh, during these times. I would try, be as, uh, to, try to be as short as possible so that uh, um, I give more uh, time for any questions that uh, could arise. Regarding, regarding uh, you know, if you just step back to, to the end of last year, you had many uh, issues that were happening. You had the trade um, uh, war or dispute between, between the U.S. and China. Uh, you had, uh, you know, uh, a lot of tension in the region. You had the, the Iranian-U.S. issue. Um, you had uh, the uncertainty of, of uh, a possible, uh, you know, um, military action that could have happened in this region that was very close to happening. Uh, all these were uncertainty that were really overshadowing the whole oil and gas industry. And then, you know, 2020 came in and uh, we had a whole host of new things that were added to, you know, to that backdrop, if you will, where we got, um, uh, you know, the, the, the coronavirus uh, issue just started, you know, uh, uh, coming up in China and nobody really understood uh, uh, you know, the, the magnitude of the situation or how it could um, explode into the world, uh, total world or take over the whole world. Um, and, you know, very untimely dispute between uh, OPEC and non-OPEC on, uh, um, you know, uh, agreeing a continuation of uh, the previous agreement between OPEC and uh, non-OPEC on the uh, cap on, on production. And uh, that dispute basically blew up uh, and uh, uh, flooded the market. Uh, immediately after that, I think people started to understand the gravity of what was happening with the COVID. And then that started taking over immediately after. So the timing of that was sort of what uh, the Americans say, a double whammy for the industry, if you will. Uh, and then uh, at, the, at the tail end of that episode, if you will, uh, we got, uh, you know, a very clear uh, decline in, in um, uh, all kinds of liquids, uh, jet fuel, uh, because of the quarantine, mass, mass transportation stopped, people started, uh, you know, uh, stopped, you know, moving around, if you will, uh, automotives and so on, and the mass transportation and the jet fuels and all that. So all that demand went away. And then when everybody quarantined, we went into an, uh, basically uh, uh, an induced recession, uh, okay. self-imposed recession, if you will, or an induced recession. So, uh, so that, that basically gave um, uh, you know, an example of you know, the things that happen is the negative price on, the, on, the, uh, on, on oil price and, and um, US due to storage and expiry of options and so on. So uh, it was, it, it, it's a, a terrible situation where you have a flooding of the market and a demand destruction, and then you quarantine everybody to, um, uh, you know, for safety of everybody around the world, and then uh, you have this. So I think for all this to clear, all the, uh, the, the storage to clear uh, from around the world, uh, you know, depending on, on many elements, is there a, a second wave or not? I mean, scientists and, and you know, med um, uh, and doctors are telling us there could be a second wave and it could be stronger in some regions or, or lighter in some regions. And, and, and how does that affect us? And do we take the aggressive approach that we have taken this time? Have we learned more and we, we adapt and live with it and not really have a full quarantine is yet to be known. These are all uncharted territory that people don't know, if you will, uh, what could happen. So depending on that and depending on how winters uh, turn out, uh, around the world and so on. I think it will take uh, anywhere from, uh, I would say, a year to two years for you to, um, to go back uh, to the storages and the demand that you used to have. So that destruction and induced 
um, uh, recession, if you will, in the economies of the world will have to be um, will have to come back will take time. So how long that takes is really anybody's guess, depending on these elements uh, that we talked about. In addition to that, you see that the entire industry got hit in a big way. Even the players that were trying to flood the market immediately realized they got themselves too deep and they had to retract. And now you're seeing a much more aggressive approach to try and uh, salvage what can be salvaged. But I think it's a little bit too late and, and uh, you know, it will take a much, much longer time than uh, people expected when they first started this uh, because of the COVID and, and, and the quarantines and so on. So uh, basically, uh, the market is not going to be uh, good, I believe, for, for some time, especially for the liquid fuels. Uh, jet fuel specifically, I think people, because we're having this meeting that we're having today, you're going to have a lot of businesses that are not going to have people travel as much, uh, be, uh, you know, they, they, they will see that, you know, we can do our business by just talking over WebEx or, uh, you know, Microsoft Teams or whatever, Zoom or whatever, uh, um, you know, technology is going to, I think, uh, force people to just stay because it's worked. People are working from home. Uh, QP inside Doha, outside, you know, if you take away the operations, we're working 80% uh, from home. So, so I, I, and similar around the world. So I think people are just going to get adjust to doing things um, without traveling as much. So I think the in airline industry is in for deep trouble for a very long time. Uh, so um, we'll, we'll see. So that that uh, basically entails jet fuel and, and refineries and all that that would would go along with it. You would have the expansion or the demand that you thought you you could have. So it's going to take time. I think gas is in a little bit of a better. Still, gas is also. Um, uh, challenged because of, of a similar situation, but I think less so because it's mostly used for households and, and electricity and, and, and so on. So, you know, I think gas will, will be uh, a little bit better, but uh, won't be far off. But all the capital expenditure that has been taken away and all the companies that are really having cash issues, uh, you know, you've seen all the majors, everybody. I mean, we're cutting costs, everybody's cutting costs. There is nobody that has not been affected. Uh, so everybody is doing that. So who will in invest uh, in these bad times? Uh, I think in, in my view, you continue your plan and you invest in the bad times because these projects are long-term, it takes time to develop and, and to deliver. And once you have, uh, you know, if you're going to just um, invest when it's an up cycle, by the time it's the next down cycle, that's when you have your production. Our projects are five to seven year projects. So we're in it for the long haul. This is uh, something that we're used to, the ups and downs of the industry. It's a cycle. This is just a much severer cycle because it's, it's man-made. There is no fundamental change in the business itself, uh, but the, it's, it's very man-made. And some of the effects could, could linger on for a longer time, uh, I think. But, but uh, I'm still confident in the long term uh, uh, for the market. As, as far as Qatar is concerned, uh, we are uh, cutting costs internally. We're doing a lot of things to, to have, a, as you've mentioned, maybe I didn't know you were going to mention about the downsizing that we've done in the past. We've been working on efficiency, joining Qatar Gas, Ras Gas. QP itself was reformed uh, you know, about five, six years ago. We did a lot of efficiency. Uh, exercises to make sure that we're very efficient in first, second quartile in all our companies. And I think we're a very lean and efficient organization across the board in all our businesses upstream and downstream. And, and working from that very efficient base, we're still working to make it more efficient because of the situation that we're in. Um, regarding our uh, major projects that we've announced in the, in the past, and Qatar North Grid expansion project is moving full steam ahead. There's no delay there. The only issue is because of the COVID and suppliers and so on. The main contract is that we, we have the technical bids. The commercial bids uh, are not in yet. They were going to be in, in April, May. And they asked us for about, uh, you know, somewhere in the three four to four month uh, delay so that we can, that they can go back to their, you know, because of uh, everybody's st stalling basically around the world. They wanted to have more time to, to, to give us the bids. And now we're on schedule to uh, award uh, all the contracts uh, by the end of the year. So the bid should be in September, October, and then award uh, by December all the uh, results. 
and we've awarded the drilling rigs. We have four platforms out of eight that are on, uh, actually uh, uh, installed in the sea, and they're, they're there. The, the additional four, which is to complete all the up, offshore structures, if you will, are going to be uh, ready by the end of the year. Um, we've already uh, contracted on uh, ship slots to, to, to build a few ships in China that we signed. I'm going to be signing in the beginning of June, uh, somewhere in the range of about 100 uh, ship slots with uh, three uh, Korean shipyards that will be announced uh, in a ceremony uh, in the first week of June. Uh, and that will basically book uh, about 120 uh, ships, uh, LNG ships uh, capacity for our expansions. And that would include uh, the Qatari developments, which, which should be uh, in 2025, we should read from 77 to 110. And in 2027, we should go to 126. And uh, some of the ships that we're ordering are going to be for second part of my discussion, which is Golden Pass. Uh, we, as you know, that uh, around this time last year, uh, we signed with ExxonMobil the final investment decision in the presence of Secretary of Energy in the U.S. in Washington, D.C. And uh, that's uh, around the 10 to $11 billion project uh, between uh, with uh, us and ExxonMobil in Sydney Pass, Texas. Uh, also, um, I had, uh, we had the honor of having uh, President uh, Trump and His Highness the Emir uh, sign uh, our uh, uh, downstream project, if you will, and, uh, which is uh, the, uh, one of the largest or the largest petrochemical uh, eating cracker uh, in the world uh, with uh, our long-term partner, CPCAM, uh, whom we have very good relationship here in Qatar and, uh, you know, with ExxonMobil, uh, you know, an excellent partner with many businesses that we have together and CPCAM, we're building a good base in, in, um, uh, in the U.S. That's the largest investment we have outside Qatar uh, by QP by far. So uh, external to that, and we're doing a lot of exploration and, and we're an upstream business primarily, and we're doing a lot of um, uh, you know, farming in and, and you know, buying, acquiring uh, you know, um, exploration blocks around the world, in, uh, Mediterranean, uh, Latin America, Africa, uh, with with the major uh, players around the world. Enough from me, and uh, you know I'll be happy to take any questions. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Your Excellency. I appreciate it. Um, uh, very comprehensive uh, and detailed, uh, and I bet it answers a lot of the questions that I saw already. Some of them coming, but I will start with uh, the first uh, question, Ambassador, and uh, have uh, uh, a question that he wants to start with. Uh, thanks, Mohammed. Thank you very much, uh, Excellency. Um, um, under your leadership, Mr. Minister, we've seen uh, QP engage in a very aggressive uh, overseas expansion in Latin America and Africa, often in partnerships with major OICs. Has the COVID uh, uh, contraction, to, for want of a better word, affected your timetable uh, for, for overseas expansion, not just to elsewhere, but particularly in the U.S.? Uh, and how do you see future investments in the U.S. after Golden Pass and uh, the CP Kim operation? Um, the, the COVID issue, I mean, and, and, uh, you know, uh, the, the effect on us and others is, is exactly the same. I mean, we are have to have, uh, you know, for COVID here in Qatar, we have a crisis management uh, team that meets every day where we have, you know, we're, we're managing, uh, we're managing basically hotels that we bring people from outside, you know, because uh, any oil and gas operation has expats and drilling that are working month on month off we have offshore operations and that can be uh, the you know easy to contract basically the virus because you're in a very closed environment we're managing hotels that we bring people into quarantine for 14 days and then we take them out test them we bought our own uh, world-class testing facility uh, you know for our uh, own equipment and, and we're testing uh, you know, people before we take them out. I mean, and and uh, so we're doing we're doing all the things that we can to make sure our operations can continue and our operations are continuing. We have not been hampered by that. Uh, you know, uh, thank God. 
So, uh, and I think most of the industry is doing the same. We're just having to, uh, having to manage it. And it's a very difficult situation, but we're managing it. It's not affected our investment per se. I mean, we're re still looking at investing. Actually, I'd say if, you, if you've read, we've gone into two exploration blocks just the last two weeks. I mean, so we're, we're still uh, looking out. We actually might uh, uh, step up our, um, uh, our entry into some blocks around the world because uh, there are opportunities that will arise. And uh, we're a company that has resources and uh, we, we're not, we're in a very good financial position and we're uh, a very lean company. We are very confident about what we're doing and, and uh, we have a strategy. I have a great leadership team working with me and, and we have great leaders in our subsidiary companies and companies that are QP sister companies, if you will. Uh, and uh, with everybody's group as a t uh, work as a team, uh, I think everybody's doing a great job and uh, we're as confident as ever and we're moving forward. There's absolutely nothing behind us. We just like to see more opportunities come in because of the situation. You know, I mean, uh, fortunately for us, we're in a position to maybe take advantage of some of the situations where we can uh, enter maybe at a better deal. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. Um, um, I actually um, just got a question from uh, uh, the Financial Times, from Andrew England from the Financial Times. Um, in, um, he's asking about um, with the uh, listen need for the energy demand, which you addressed in, in your keynote uh, uh, speech, but he's specifically asking if currently Qatar uh, uh, Petroleum or Qatar Gas is looking to reduce production, even in the short term, uh, until the demand has increased or not. I, I read an article about uh, about that, uh, I think a while, a week ago or so, where we're in a lose-lose or somebody wrote some article that we, we could be shutting down or reducing production. Um, I'm not sure if, if whoever, you know, I mean, if you analyze the market of LNG or if you're looking at uh, oil or if you're looking at petrochemical or you're looking at garments, and you have factories around the world, okay? Uh, the, the, when you have factories around the world and, and, and whatever product, once you have an issue with the demand, the most expensive people go out first. They can't sell, they're selling at a loss. So I think a whole bunch of people would have to close down LNG before it gets to us. We're the cheapest LNG producer from an efficiency point of view and a cost of production point of view in the world. So I think if a lot of people stop their production, um, uh, we'll probably get a better price boost than, than uh, stop. So I think it will be very, very difficult to see. If we stop selling LNG because of cost, uh, or, you know, because of cost, uh, that means there is something drastically wrong in the LNG market. It's not us. So, so there is absolutely no way that we would be uh, reducing production. We have, we have uh, terminals that we own and, and in the UK and in, in, um, Italy, we have terminals in, in Europe that we just bought capacity of Zeebrook terminal for uh, until 2044. We just uh, West Coast, you know, Montreux uh, terminal in, in France. We are also, we have access to many uh, terminals to our um, uh, you know, partners, I mean, and there is a lot of demand for gas uh, around the world. So th there is no issue on that. It slowed down definitely because of the pandemic. Prices have been uh, very low and, and uh, the prices are absolutely at a level that is, that is, that is too low for anybody. Uh, but I think we, uh, for us to feel the, uh, the pain of, of prices, uh, will be very, uh, very, very low on the pecking order, if you will. So I'm not worried about gas at all. We're, we're full steam ahead, we're gonna expand. And if there is room to go above 126, you might hear us in a few years go for it. We have plenty of gas to do that. Uh, thank you, Excellency. And in, in, in the same time, uh, the, actually the second question that they asked from the financial time was, is that actually helping you be in pushing U.S. gas producers that they cannot keep with the uh, low prices. Is, is that actually a good platform? Um, the, the, the question is for QP to actually expand and strengthen its position in the international global market because the others are leaving. 
You see, we are uh, we are in the gas market in the U.S. We're building the largest single investment of LNG exports from the U.S. in Golden Pass. I mean, uh, the cost base and the way we have structured Golden Pass, and with our portfolio of gas that we have around the world, uh, we are not worried about that at all. I think uh, more gas coming out of the U.S. is going to be good for us. It's the the people that can do it at the right um, uh, you know cost structure. And I think I think uh, single players that are just looking at it as, uh, you know, a single um, uh, development of just looking at uh, a terminal that they export from and that's their business, uh, you know, and in rough markets they're not going to make it. Uh, but, you know, players that have a portfolio like ours and and that are looking at it to, to integrate it and and to have a trading business and and an overall global look at it uh, would always. Uh, uh, I think benefit from having some gas volume that come out of the U.S. and and some from Qatar. I always uh, uh, keep saying we don't compete with anybody. We compete with ourselves. We want to make our LNG safe, reliable, efficient. We want to be uh, you know safe for our facilities and our people and and people that work with us go home. Uh, you know, safe and they, they like working with us in a good environment. And we we want to have, uh, you know, the, the best efficiency from a cost perspective and uh, reliability and safety. We've, we've had, you know, customers that have had 20 plus years I and mean, 23 years to Japan without a single uh, shipment missed, even during blockades, during the war, during, uh, you know, the Gulf War, never missed a shipment. That's the reliability that we're proud of. Thank you, Your Excellency. Um, uh, the, an, another question that came from uh, uh, actually uh, Stephen Kovacs from Exceler Energy, which is a partner to, to, with uh, with Qatar Petroleum. Um, I'm from, sorry, I didn't hear from where. Uh, uh, from uh, 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 Stephen Kovacs, actually from uh, uh, Accelerate Energy. All right. Okay. He's yes. asking um, with Qatar decision to leave OPEC in January 2019. Um, how do you see OPEC role in uh, in the markets over the past year and moving forward? Uh, OPEC, you know, when we left OPEC, we were very clear. You know, uh, we were very clear. We, we didn't like our role there. We don't have enough say in the organization and we're a very small player. Uh, so, so the, and, you know, so these are main elements. And the, the most important element is we're heading into the gas business. We're the biggest gas player. We're going to expand in gas. And that's where we're, we're, we're for putting our effort and focus uh, is on gas. And that's why we left OPEC. But part of it is we had no, decision, no say in what happens in OPEC because of our size uh, and so on. So I think, I think you know, uh, OPEC uh, you know, is an organization. I think you should ask OPEC how they think they are faring, but I, but uh, I think the, uh, you know, with with what we've seen happen uh, recently, I'm happy that we're out of all. Thank you, Excellency. Um, I know that uh, Ambassador and uh, you had a, a second question for His Excellency. Excellency, I, I want to give you a chance. When we met with you in December, uh, I think uh, we were. There were a number of environmental initiatives that were underway that I think don't have the visibility that perhaps they should. And you talked about the new move into solar and carbon sequestration and, and QP's efforts. Uh, and, and this makes sense because Qatar is probably a country that would be more vulnerable to climate change than most. But could you talk about some of your environmental initiatives and, and if there are opportunities for American companies to, to partner with those? Yeah, on the uh, thank you, Anna. I mean, we, we actually do not talk enough about what we're doing in the environment. We need to change that, and, and somebody's hopefully working on that in our organization to do it. But uh, but you're right. We're doing a lot of things in that uh, regard. We've uh, we already started, uh, you know, two and a half million tons of CO2 sequestration. You know, we're not a listed company. We don't have environmental regulations or somebody that's chasing us for a CO2. Uh, emission number, but we're you know uh, we're doing it because we think that's the right thing to do. So we're actually injecting uh, you know two and a half million tons of CO2. That's the largest injection in the MENA region. 
uh, that's happening today. We're also in the Northfield expansion project, uh, you know, that we have. We have Northfield East, which is the first expansion, and the second expansion, which we call now Northfield South. Uh, we, we are going to have combined about another 5 million tons of uh, CO2 sequestration that will happen when all these are online uh, and producing. So we'll have about seven and a half million tons annually injected into the ground uh, of CO2. So that's a very substantial amount. I think this is unheard of as far as the size in, in one proximity. In addition to that, we have uh, deployed the best NOx and SOx uh, uh, emission technologies using you know the best technologies available to all the vendors and, and uh, you know GE and others uh, that are working with us to make sure that we have you know about uh, you know 50 percent reduction in NOx and SOx uh, the, uh, so the best available technology to reduce all these uh, emissions we have a huge program on uh, methane emissions uh, over across the entire industry where methane emission is also a big thing uh, that we need to uh, take care of and we're putting targets for every company and we're working on that uh, very uh, closely. Uh, in my capacity as Minister of Energy, um, also I oversee the electricity in the country and we have um, just awarded uh, two months ago, since we, when, when I talked it wasn't in, uh, you know, uh, taken as a final decision uh, contractually and I mentioned that to you I think in our discussion as you mentioned. Uh, we, uh, just a couple of months ago, we actually signed uh, the contract for uh, uh, a 25 years uh, uh, contract where QP is actually part of a company that will develop the solar plant. Uh, so uh, us and the electricity company with foreign partners are building the first uh, ever solar plant built in Qatar. Uh, and uh, the scale is about 800 megawatts, which is around 10% of our summer capacity in Qatar, which is quite uh, substantial in one shot. In addition to that, in QP itself, we have a project where we're going to be building uh, our own captive solar, uh, solar um, uh, power plants to substitute gas power plants that we have today for our own internal consumptions for captive power, uh, which will basically reduce our gas emissions uh, or emissions uh, in general, although these are you know the best technology we can have for electricity that we're using burning gas, but we're also shutting these down as much as we can to use solar. Uh, so we're doing a lot of things uh, you know, in that regard, and I, I, and we have plans to do more. Thank you, Your Excellency. Um, Another question uh, from uh, actually ExxonMobil from Liam. He actually have a shout out for you, thanking you for mentioning them and the partnership uh, for their and their appreciation. He's asking, how do you feel about? Um, and I'm I'm reading the question and I'm not sure if it's exactly what he meant. But how do you feel about the EPC capabilities on these large projects? Is there uh, on large projects? On large projects. A shout out to Liam too. So hello Liam and everybody from ExxonMobil. Uh, but uh, you know, APC contractors uh, are also struggling like the IOCs. They've been struggling for a while. I mean, he knows some of the companies that we work with together that, uh, and some of them that are actually here with us. They have been challenging times for contractors before this COVID issue. And I think what's happening with the COVID uh, um, issue around the world is hurting all businesses and 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 uh, contractors are no different. Uh, so I think it's going to be a, a quite a rough time, but we have always worked with EPC contractors in partnership to try and have a win-win uh, proposition where we can work together. We need them and they need us. And I think in partnership we can we can get things done. Uh, but I think um, you know these uh, contractors see um, you know. The, uh, the future, if you will, and, and they are going to be projects that will be, the, the project um, pipeline has shrunk for sure because of the capital expenditure. Uh, uh, you know, um, basically everybody is, is, is cutting their capital expenditure around the world, but some more aggressively than others. Uh, that is going to have an impact, but I think like we down, downsize as companies, they're going to downsize and they've been through this before and they will come out of it uh, hopefully strong. 
Thank you, Your Excellency. Um, another question uh, about uh, cutting prices. And the, um, the question is mainly, would it be uh, cut its prices to gain more ground in the Asian market? Uh, and uh, um, the other part of the question is, is the uh, gas going to face uh, storage capability uh, problem as well, or uh, storage availability uh, specifically in these markets as well? Uh, cutting prices, of course, you know, I mean, prices, there isn't a set price like oil. Oil is a completely different thing uh, than gas, and gas are mostly uh, contracts where you have long-term contracts. Uh, most of the countries that depend on gas want long-term supply. At, uh, these are strategic assets that they have that they want to supply, like power plants, so there is a strategic element to that. So the majority of countries would have a large portion of their gas and long-term contracts that are secure, from credible partners that that can deliver, uh, you know, consistently and have a track record uh, such as us. So there is a premium for 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 that. But in, in uh, as far as prices are concerned, we these are set over the different uh, discussions at different times. So uh, sometimes it's a buyer's market, sometimes it's a seller's market, and you have to go with the market conditions at the time. So once you have a deal, that would dictate the time and the event and and the duration and, and the partnership that you have will dictate what kind of pricing mechanism you have uh, at the time. So it's difficult to say whether you'll cut prices, uh, you know, uh, to, to gain uh, uh, market share is, is what I understood from you. Uh, that could be something that you could do in, in some events. And we're not in a hurry. As far as we're concerned, we're not in a hurry. We're doing things methodically. We're, we're, we're negotiating different deals for long term. Uh, uh, deals and some will be shorter terms and some, uh, you know, even if we stay without long-term deals for a, a long time, we will be able to withstand what others can. So I'm not worried about that. Um, thank you, Your Excellency. Um, the other question that came here um, from Bloomberg, uh, actually from Verity Ratcliffe from Bloomberg, uh, they're asking as a follow-up to, to the notes about the potential realignment and uh, uh, for uh, staff and workers at UP, but they're trying to ask more in, in, in detail if there is a specific numbers or percentage that uh, of job cuts in, in, in during this uh, restructuring or because of the uh, energy market uh, uh, position. We are uh, we are looking at all our companies, and we have uh, looked at how can we cut costs in all our countries. All the major capital projects are are moving ahead. There is no capital expenditure and projects that affect production or uh, future developments that have been removed. We have removed other items where uh, we had some things that are good to have or complementary uh, that we were, were planning, but nothing that would cut our major strategy development, uh, if you will. So if you look at, I can't, uh, I don't like to talk about specifics about people. I've never ever, even when we had downsizing in the past, I've never talked about the number of people that we uh, have, uh, you know, thanked for working with us and, and, and uh, uh, really uh, released, if you will, uh, because these are human beings and people, and I don't like to hurt people by saying this is a number of people that we have just released as if uh, they do, we don't care about them. It's a situation that has caused us to do uh, this. Uh, it hurts when you have a colleague that you had to let go for different, uh, you know, uh, diff from different areas of your business. But, uh, you know, this is a business. Everybody has to do it. So as far as a number that I can uh, maybe uh, give uh, uh, the gentleman from Bloomberg is, is uh, we are, we finished the exercise really, and, and we're going to, uh, uh, go through with really the budget revision and putting every, all the new numbers in and, and uh, the manpower releases and all that uh, after uh, this break. So in June, we will be uh, somewhere in the range of 30% uh, reduction in total expenditure, CapEx and office. So it's quite sizable. Thank you, Excellency. Um, there's another shot actually from uh, Alistair from ExxonMobil. And that one and specifically, um, he's saying. Uh, who, who from mobile? Sorry, Alistair. Alistair. 
No, he can walk down the road and ask me. He shouldn't ask me over the road. <laughs> he's, he's actually saying thank you for. <laughs> but 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 it's because he's uh, you know he's he's obeying the law. You know, everybody's saying uh, social distancing. Okay, go ahead, please. Yeah. He's, he's thanking uh, Qatar actually in general for the free health care that is provided as a long-term resident in there, and that's helping during this pandemic. His question is, um, what is the uh, what is the ultimate goal in, in the international expansion, um, and how would QP uh, and uh, will measure the success in these international expansions? I want to be like ExxonMobil, like his company. I want to people to uh, I, I want people to talk about QP as an international company and no longer have the NOC in front of it. And that will be achieving my goal. Fantastic. Fantastic. And in the sense of not only just how much we have internationally, but I, in the sense of the we have great uh, people, uh, you know, colleagues that work for us, the men and women that make out QP and the leadership in QP and the QP. Uh, sister companies, if you will, and, and uh, uh, subsidiaries. Uh, we have excellent talent, excellent people, some local, some expat uh, community that are all, all working as one family to achieve our objectives. And I think, you know, my success to QP, uh, in my view, is when I leave QP, I'm not going to be the CEO forever. In a few years, uh, you know, uh, somebody else will come in. What I want to see for QP is everybody looks at QP and sees it as an international professional company, regardless of where they're working, whether it's in Qatar or anywhere in the world. You have multiple nationalities working proudly as brothers and sisters, if you will, in one family working together, achieving a very defined, clear strategy with the best governance you can have. And the way we look at our governance, our structure, our ethical standards, our transparency, everything we look at is we're looking at being an international company. Uh, for the first year this year, QP is fully IFRS compliant as far as uh, our books are concerned. So, uh, you know, it, it, we, we treat ourselves as if we are a listed company, if you will, in the standard that we like to do to, toward our Serves up to so I think if if we are seen uh, you know that way regardless of the where we are we're going to expand in a big way outside I mean you're going to see us in upstream business in a huge expansion outside that's our ambition is to be uh, everywhere where there is uh, you know excellent exploration and development you find us uh, trying trying to 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 participate uh, with good partners like Exxon like. Uh, uh, you know our, our great partners that we work with because we have such a good relationship and very uh, a trusting relationship i think and, and for companies like exxon and and and, and cp cam and, and and the american companies that work with us and the european companies when you know the image that they have about us and what they say about us is very important for me because uh, you know we are a, a team that works together in, in trying to achieve a strategy that's very defined, very clear. And we don't want to be seen as a national oil company that has bureaucracy and so on. A lot of the national oil companies are bureaucracies controlled by politics and, and they are not uh, fully liberal, if you will, as, as a company to do what they want. We're different. We are a very special organization where His Highness the Emir has given us uh, that duty to deliver and to make this company like an ExxonMobil, like a a Chevron, like a, uh, you know, uh, a Shell, uh, you know, uh, to be seen that way. So that's our ambition. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. Um, um, one question, actually, um, I have, um, we talked about uh, when we were in Doha last year with the local localization initiative that uh, QP initiated. Um, uh, and I know that early, uh, uh, Last year, it was initiated. The plans were put forward. Um, where does this stand with the localization? And is this is connected to the uh, total supply chain that's going to feed on the new expansions and the current existing one? Uh, and how would it extend as well to international markets, specifically the U.S. market? 
Uh, regarding regarding the uh, what you're talking about is totin. Uh, okay, so uh, explained in in, uh, in English, totin uh, is is, is uh, explain is sorry translated as nationalizing uh, basically the supply chain. So trying to have as much as possible uh, of the supply chain in country. Uh, so we invite companies like Slumberger, like GE, like. Uh, you know these uh, big conglomerates that that are in the uh, service uh, industry and and contracting in this industry working with us in the industry to have a home base here or a, a large enough base that they could get points for for being setting up in this uh, country to serve the business so nobody's going to come for uh, uh, just for 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 uh, you know being located in Qatar if there is no business nobody will come so the, we understand that and and it's because they have good business here that they are setting up but uh, the system works in, in a sense to give you points for 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 being in the country and not being in somewhere in the region where your office base is somewhere else and you're supplying us from somewhere else so you want to create an ecosystem where um, if GE has a workshop here then you'll have an ecosystem of smaller companies that will be around them to serve them. And then you have a scoring scheme where this company up to the subcontractors and so on score a score, and then they get an advantage in pricing uh, uh, in, in uh, getting awards. So we would award somebody that is slightly higher uh, bid by you know 5% or 10% because of their uh, in-country value, ICV, we call it. And that's really for big projects and small projects. So for everything in, in the business. And that actually has just been rolled out and companies have already been uh, registered and we have uh, you know, a very uh, clear uh, methodology of how this is calculated. And it, it's, a small, it's something that will have teething problems. You know, and it's a new thing that's happening, but it's happened around the world. We've, we've looked at different benchmarks around the world and we're trying to learn from mistakes. But we want to help the economy by doing that. You have a supply chain issue, which we had when we had the blockade. So we're trying to serve that in, in the sense, having all our requirements for the supply chain of our industry in country, in addition to helping the economy by having uh, really a growth of GDP by doing it here versus outside. And of course, bringing white collar workers is one of the main objectives also uh, into the country where we have uh, experts that come with this that are white color workers that will be good for the economy and uh, as you can uh, as you know from uh, visiting Qatar we like uh, having a lot of experts in Qatar and uh, I, th I think they enjoy being here. I know Ambassador Anne had another question about actually the women in workforce with you. Please. Uh, thank you uh, Excellency. Uh, I've been struck with the all the um, women engineers that covers been graduating because they're you graduate vastly more female engineers on a per capita basis than the United States does. And obviously this is it's very important to get the best you possibly can out of your universities. Has Cutter Petroleum been a driver of this, uh, the the abundance of female engineers? And how do you do on hiring these female engineers right out of the schools like Texas A&M? Uh, of course, uh, I mean, uh, there are a lot of girls that, uh, more girls that, that actually graduate from high school than uh, boys, if you will. Uh, they, 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 study, uh, they study more, I think, and, and they're focused more than, than young boys. Uh, uh, are so they score higher and they get into better schools and, and we have Texas A&M here which is a great school that you know and, and uh, uh, they apply to the engineering discipline and for us we don't uh, we, we basically take the best students uh, male or female and we happen to have a lot of uh, uh, girls and, and uh, you know graduate and, and actually come work for us some of them we have issues with some of them where uh, you know, they would come and their expectation is they would have an office job. And uh, when you're a you know, mechanical or an electrical engineer and you don't want to go to the site, it's a difficulty. We're managing it with some and some do, doesn't work out. But we are very inviting for, for uh, you know, I mean, gender doesn't come into what you, who you employ. 
we have uh, in all disciplines. I mean, our uh, public relations and communications manager, I think she's on the call with us today, uh, is, is a very smart lady with an MBA from Harvard. And, and, and uh, uh, you know, we have, we have uh, many uh, qualified engineers and we have reservoir engineers, geologists, we have accounting, uh, you know, uh, ladies and, and in, um, in our accounting and, and different disciplines that are there. So for us, I, I don't care, you know, I don't talk about gender because we don't care what the gender is. It's, it's work and they all are treated the same and they get the same salaries, they do the same thing and, and that's how we look at it. Although, you know, you talk about an Arab country and so on, I think the perception is, is, uh, is not there that we would be uh, doing it that way, but that's actually what we do. It's, it's just, we, ha we have an open system where people apply and, uh, and they can come in. And as I told you, the only issue with the engineer, uh, with the engineer uh, ladies that, that come out is, is some of them not accepting to work in sites. And if they don't, it's, it's a difficulty that we have. And that will be the same whether it's in the US or here or anywhere. That has, it doesn't have to do with the gender. So if she accepts, she accepts, she doesn't, she doesn't. So. Great, thank you, Excellency. Um, another question as a part of uh, the capacity, storage capacity. Um, do you envision that the, in, in the global vision that there could be gas storage uh, capacity issues as ha what happened with the oil or that's a total different? Uh, you know, gas, gas is a completely different uh, issue because, you know, when you talk about storage, if you're talking, you see, when you look at Europe, for instance, and they talk about LNG into Europe, uh, people have this mis, you know, they have this, this perception that uh, I want to compare LNG uh, and gas. And, and if, you, if you compare all the LNG that goes into Europe with the gas that's coming out of different places and mainly Russia into Europe, it's a droplet, it's nothing. Okay, it's, it's a very small amount that would be coming. So gas that's coming by LNG, storing that is very expensive. So storing gas in caverns and, and, and maybe a pipelines are a great storage uh, place, by the way. I mean, a lot of gases can be stored uh, because you have, you know, thousands of kilometers of pipelines that give you, a, you know, good room, but, but it's not storage exactly, but it gives you a little bit more of a room to maneuver. Where, as in LNG, you, you don't have, uh, you know, that luxury because every tank that you, you're going to build is going to cost you a hundred million uh, dollar plus, you know, for, uh, you know, for a 125,000 uh, uh, cubic meter uh, LNG uh, tank that is cryogenic and has to be cooled and it's very expensive. So it's, it's, it's difficult to, to, to do that. And I, I don't see a situation where we're going to have the supply that much over, uh, you know, riding the demand. Thank you, Excellency. Um, uh, you indicated um, uh, on the Qatar petroleum investments across the globe, uh, a lot of announcements in Guinea, uh, Mexico, Kenya, um, that's in America. Is there a specific priorities that uh, with the investments of the international market, or is it all treated equally uh, depending on, on, on the, of course, the outcomes of these investments? Uh, you mean, you mean uh, priority in where we go, where we choose to go? Where, uh, priority on some of these announcements, is there priorities on which one's going to yeah. come in? No, you see, you see the, way, the way this works is we have technical teams and, and uh, you know, that look at uh, basically investing in exploration. Uh, they look at the geology and, and, you know, prospectivity of different areas. And, uh, you know, we look at the opportunities and some places open up more than others as far as bidding and, and some are direct uh, discussions to enter into uh, different areas through partners or through uh, different. So it's ranked technically and then it is what we can get into. What we get into is much less than what we're trying to get into or what we actually review. You review things and you don't like them and you move on, but it's mostly based on, on the probability of success technically. Thank you, uh, Your Excellency, on that. Um, on, on, on the other question is, uh, is there other initiatives that you'd be looking for to increase efficiencies beyond the restructuring and uh, what you mentioned in your speech? 
um, any other initiatives to increase efficiencies and production. And uh, part as well from this question that came is did QP also start looking into securing uh, customers for the increased uh, production by uh, 2027? Yeah, you, you see, uh, of course, we're working with many customers to look at, uh, you know, uh, their requirements for the future. And we're working with some of the major customers to see uh, their requirements uh, for the future. And these are long term discussions and will take time to develop. Uh, but uh, over time, I think uh, with um, with the slowdown that's happening and us moving forward, I think we're in a uh, position to have uh, a good, uh, I think, advantage uh, going forward in uh, having, you know, six LNG trains uh, um, uh, that that will be coming online uh, in, uh, in the next uh, in seven years or so. So I think, uh, you know, that kind of volume uh, will have to be placed in different areas. And that's why you see us uh, really uh, securing uh, homes around, around Europe and, and we're looking at some other places in Europe and in Asia, and we're working with partners and uh, allocating some uh, developments. One of the things that we didn't talk about is U.S. companies' participation in Northfield expansion, and and uh, that is uh, still on the table, and things are going well there. It's it's just that we're waiting for having all the uh, capital cost elements. We decided to bring and all the APC costs, everything to be put on the table and you know exactly what it costs so that whoever comes in and wants to come in, comes in with open eyes, understanding the cost, knowing where we are, and then moving forward. We wanna eliminate as much risk, uh, de-risk the project, if you will, as much as possible from a uh, guessing of, of what the final cost uh, could be. So once we get the APC costs in by the end of the year, we will be giving these costs to the companies that are participating and we have three companies, uh, US companies that are participating, uh, Exxon, Chevron, and Conor Phillips are participating in this. Uh, and and uh, we hope that we, they will all have a chance uh, to come in and, and work with us. Thank you, Dr. Sonsi. Um, we're almost at the end of the hour that we uh, allocated for the webinar. So I. There's a lot of questions. Again, everyone is interested to hear your thoughts about many topics, international, political, even uh, 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 China and the US issue. But uh, for the sake of time, um, uh, I wanna uh, uh, give uh, Ambassador Anne a minute. Uh, she wants to say final words or if she has any other question and um, we'll uh, leave the rest of time for you. Can I just say one thing, because you have a lot of Americans that are here. First, my condolences to all the American lives lost in the U.S. I mean, I, 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 uh, 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 I should have mentioned that in the beginning. It is a tragedy to see that number of people uh, die, and, and our condolences and, and prayers to them. Uh, regarding Qatar, because you have a big American community here, and I think Alistair uh, mentioned our medical facilities here. I think our medical teams here are doing a great job. They are, really taking care of everybody. We have a big workforce uh, for our construction and, and development and infrastructure. And the numbers you see that are announced, I mean, the majority, 97 to 98% of the uh, cases here are, are asymptomatic, but the government has put facilities all over the place to, uh, uh, to quarantine people. I mean, they are, uh, they are quarantined for free. They are giving food for free. They are giving medication for free. And at any level, whether it's blue color, white color, uh, American, uh, Indian, Qatari, they're all treated the same. They're all given uh, free um, uh, medical care and, and are taken care of uh, fully. So uh, I think this is something that's a very good um, uh, credit to our medical uh, uh, teams that are here. And we thank our medical team, but also it is a, it is a, a very, generous approach from design as the Emir to make sure that everybody living on this land will get free medical care in this pandemic, uh, which they are getting equally like everybody else. I just wanted to mention that because you have some American friends here or somebody uh, that could be here, it's, they're all taken care of and hopefully uh, we have only, you know, we have one, one life lost is too much, but we have, a, I think 15 or 16 out of 30,000 that is infected, so it's quite, our medical teams are doing great, and I hope 
they continue the same track at the level where he you know, gets out of this safe. Thank you, Excellency. Uh, okay. Appreciate that. And any final words uh, before we go to a closing? Uh, let me, Minister, Excellency, let me thank you for your condolences. I think most Americans are in a uh, considerable state of shock about the situation here, but I do want to say how proud we are as Americans to be a to have been a strong ally of Qatar for so many years in the finance and defense, and particularly in energy. Uh, and we're all very optimistic that that partnership will only expand and grow in the future uh, to mutual benefit. But I want to thank you personally for taking so much time with us today and with, uh, with the audience. I know it's, uh, it's, um, it's a holy and time of year for you. So uh, thank you for all the best. We wish you and your family and your colleagues at QP all the best at this time. And, uh, and again, I very much appreciate your time. Thank you very much, and, and uh, I'd like to, again, thank you for uh, uh, inviting me for this uh, webinar event, and, and I wish everybody all the best, and we pray for everybody to stay safe, and, and uh, uh, you know, hopefully see you uh, in person soon. Thank you, Excellency. Thank you, thank you. Ambassador. And, and I, I final words as well. I wanted to also say, uh, thank the Qatar Embassy in, in Washington, D.C., in the U.S., for always being in touch in, in, with the business community, with uh, with the Qatar business community, His Excellency Ambassador Mishal and his team have been fantastic on that side, keeping everyone in the loop and coordinating all these things. Uh, your team as well, Your Excellency, and USQBC team as well for putting all this together. We appreciate your time and uh, uh, we wish you happy Eid that's coming on Sunday or Saturday. Um, and now uh, everyone stay safe uh, uh, during these times. Thank you, Mohammed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye.